preach about the church that married the world. The church that married the world. That's a warning to the worldly of us in here this morning. That God despises Christians who compromise. Amen, amen. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith says he which hath the sharp sword with two edges, and know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17 reads, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. If Ephesus was the fallen church plagued by fundamentalism, if Smyrna was the fearful church plagued by ritualism, Pergamos was the faltering church plagued by clericalism. The city of Pergamos was the capital of Asia Minor. Two special features caused this city to stand out in its time. Pergamos had a library with over 200 volumes, 200,000 volumes of books. And that may not seem like much in our time, but in those days, books were handwritten on papyrus and parchment. Uh, parchment paper was invented in Pergamos. And there were 200,000 handwritten volumes of books in that library in the first century. And then in Pergamos was the temple of Asclepius. Asclepius was the god of healing and the god of of medicine. Uh, it was symbolized by intertwined snakes on a staff, which is even now a symbol of medicine in our time. In the temple of Asclepius, a person who was sick would go in that temple and spend the night. Uh, the temple was covered on the floor with snakes. There were snakes all over the temple, and a sick person would go in there and spend the night in a temple full of snakes. And they believed that if a snake crawled over you without causing you harm, you were healed of your sickness. Uh, it is the Christian congregation in this city that Jesus addresses this letter. They were in desperate need of a word from the Lord. 
And that's why Jesus appears to them as the one with the sharp sword with two edges. The sharp sword with two edges symbolizes the word of God. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And Jesus appears to them to give them a word from the Lord. This church, brothers and sisters, was doctrinally pure, but they had drifted into compromise. And there was always the danger, Lily Grove, that we might hold right doctrines but still drift into compromise with the world. Because you can know the scriptures and still be carnal, fleshly, worldly, and compromised. Jesus has for them in verse number 13 a word of commendation. He says, I know your works, and I know where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. He knows, brothers and sisters, their situation. The church operated in the middle of a city chosen by Satan as his headquarters on earth. Uh, contrary to popular belief, and erroneous doctrine being spewed even at the church, Satan is not yet in hell. As a matter of fact, Satan hates hell more than the unregenerate. Satan does not want to go to hell. He will ultimately end up there, but Satan has not been bound and cast into hell yet. Come on, talk back to me if you can. It's, it's, it's false. You can tell people who are ignorant who say, I bind the devil. How are you going to do what God hasn't done yet? God hasn't bound him to hell yet. Satan is not yet in hell. Satan is at Lily Grove. He's at your house. He's on your job. He's in your family. He's going to and fro seeking whom he may devour. Satan is not in hell because he is the God of this world. God, small g, he is the God of this world. He is the prince of the power of the air. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil is everywhere in the world and he's not in hell yet because he is trying to destroy the church of God. He says, I know your situation. And then he said, I know your steadfastness. Uh, uh, there are two words translated dwell in the New Testament. One word dwell means to take up a temporary dwelling. But in this particular verse, the other word dwell means to settle down to stay. It means to take up permanent residence. This church at Pergamos had settled down to stay. They did not move out of their community even though Satan was persecuting them. Uh, uh, some, some months ago, some of the brothers and I went over to a bank here in Houston to try to secure financing for the building of our new uh, sanctuary. And uh, we sat down with them and they looked at our financials and they looked at all of our bank statements and they looked at our record and they were really impressed about how we handle business and how we move as a church and uh, they had sat down with us and they were ready to make the loan they were ready to make the move until they came to see where the church was uh, 
they, they came in the neighborhood, in the hood where the church is, and, and decided that we would loan you the money if you were in West University or if you moved the church on 288, but they could not see loaning a huge sum of money in this depressed neighborhood. And a lesser church would move to where they could get the money. But the sin is not in West University. The drugs are not on 288. The problems are not in River Oaks. The church has got to be where the problems are because they that are well don't need a physician. Somebody ought to help me talking. Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. And as the body of Christ, where sin abounds, grace ought to much more abound. Uh, we don't need to move away from this corner because there's sin on this corner. There are sinners in this neighborhood. And no matter how beautiful this church is, it's not what God wants it to be if we don't reach the lost. If we don't go after the perishing. If we don't rescue the dying. If we don't preach the gospel, we're just a beautiful building. So, so we told them, thank you for sitting with us. Thank you for your consideration. But we're not moving our church because this is where the problems are. Uh, I, I know there's some problems in the suburbs. I know there's some problems in gated communities. But God has called us to witness on this corner. God has called us to be light and salt on this corner. And if we don't do what God calls us to do, it don't matter if we move on 288. It don't matter if we move to Pearland. If we're not doing what God told us to do, we're just a beautiful building on the corner of Till Western Avenue. And then people don't come to this church because we got a nice building. People don't come to this church because they want to hear good singing. People come from all over this city because they want to hear a word from the Lord. And where the word is preached, people who love the word will get up and find their way to where that church is. Because Lily Grove ain't on the way nowhere. You got to find your way back here on this corner. But if it's a good piece of meat being cooked, somebody ought to help me preach it. If the word is being preached, People will find where you are. Uh, I, 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 Jesus said, he commends them because they hold fast to his name. They hold fast to his name. There are some churches you visit and the name of Jesus is never mentioned. Beautiful music, wonderful band, lights and, and, and show, but the name Jesus is never mentioned. And we ought not ever come in church or ever hear preaching that's not Call the name of Jesus. I'm here this morning because of a name. I'm saved today because of a name. I'm on my way to heaven today because I've got confidence in that name. There's power in that name. There's healing. There's sweetness. There's deliver, there's joy, there's peace, and I haven't even called that name yet. You're getting excited just at the anticipating 
the sound of that name. He's a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in a time of storm. He's a friend when you're friendless. A doctor in a sick room. And I haven't even called that name yet. He's Adam's redeemer. Abel's vindicator. Abraham's sacrifice. Noah's ark. Moses Bush. I haven't even called that name yet. Jesus. Jesus is a sin killing name. Jesus is a life imparting name. Jesus. Early in the morning. Jesus. Late in the evening. Jesus. In your midnight hour. Jesus. There is a name. I love to hear. I love to sing his words. It sounds like music in my ear. It's the sweetest name on earth. Oh, I wish I had somebody to help me. How I love Jesus. And the reason why I love him is because he first loved me. They held fast to the name and they did not deny the faith. Um, there are some non-negotiables in Christianity. There are some non-negotiables in Christianity. Now we can negotiate the color of carpet. We can negotiate to have flowers, uh, artificial or live, on Women's Day. We can negotiate salaries, church and pastor's anniversary. That's open for negotiation. But there are some non-negotiables. And let me list them for you this morning. The Bible is the inspired word of God, inerrant and infallible. That's non-negotiable. Jesus was born of a virgin. That's non-negotiable. Jesus died a vicarious death on the cross that is efficacious for my sin. That's non-negotiable. Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday morning. That's non-negotiable. Don't ever let the world squeeze you into its mold where you start talking that silly talk that the Bible is just a good book. No, To Kill a Mockingbird is a good book. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. War and Peace, Pride and Prejudice are good books. But when I read them, I don't get salvation. But when I read the Bible, somebody ought to help me preach it. There's power in the word that's written. Because the Bible written is God's speech. And when God speaks, that's non-negotiable. He says, I know your works. I know your sacrifice. Oh, he talks about the martyr for the faith at the church at Pergamos named Antipas. Antipas, every year, um, the, the citizens of Rome had to take a pinch of incense and uh, put it on the fiery altar of the temple and pledge that Caesar is God. Well, the Christians refused to acknowledge Caesar as God. 
And so they were being persecuted because they would not bow to Caesar. So they made an example of Antipas and made him a martyr at the church at Pergamos. They made a brass bull and put Antipas in that bull and set fire underneath that bull and roasted Antipas alive, killed him, martyred him for the faith. But instead of the church getting weaker, the church got stronger. And brothers and sisters, you hear me. If you would live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. And the only people here that the devil ain't bothering is people here who ain't bothering the devil. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Because if you're trying to live a godly lifestyle, there will be temptations and trials and persecutions because the devil knows that in God's hand, you are a mighty tool, so he will do everything he can to snatch you out of God's hand. But I hear Jesus saying, who I hold in my hand, the devil in hell, can't pluck him out. You'll be manipulated by the devil, stimulated by the devil, motivated by the devil, activated by the devil, but you can never again be possessed by the devil because when Christ saved you, he put a sign over your soul under new management. I am not the same. Uh, but then he says, I got something against you. All the aforementioned, he says, I appreciate your, your standing for doctrine and, your, and I appreciate your holding fast to my name and you haven't denied the faith. I appreciate the sacrifices that you made for the cause, but I've got something, a few things against you. Because there are those among you who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, brothers and sisters, you got to read the Bible to help me preach here. He confronts their compromise. The name Pergamos means married. They were literally in an unequal yoke with unbelievers. There's corruption in their membership. You, you got to read the Bible to help me right here. Because in the, in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, around chapter 22, there was a prophet, a false prophet, by the name of Balaam. And Balaam is hired by Balak, the king of Moab. And the king of Moab who hires Balaam, this prophet who wants money, he's a prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T. I wish I had time to stay right there. But, but he's doing what he's doing for profit. And so he, he, is, he is hired by Balak, king of Moab, to curse the children of Israel. But God is watching. I wish I had a Bible reader. Every time he curses Israel, God turns it into a blessing. Four times he curses the children of Israel. And four times, God turns that curse into a blessing. Read it when you get home. And so Balaam goes back to Balak, king of Moab, and says, we're not going to be able to curse these people. Because every time I try to curse them, God turns that curse into a blessing. He said, I got an idea. Instead of cursing them, let's corrupt them. Somebody ought to help me preach it. 
He corrupts them with pagan worship, idolatry, immorality. He, rather than curse them because God turns the, the, the curses into blessings, Balaam says, if they corrupt themselves, God is going to have to punish them. And if God punishes them because he can't allow them to do what they're doing without consequences, they will be right where we want them. And brothers and sisters, you hear me? The devil, in uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, he has a young apprentice uh, named Wormwood uh, that he sends to, to, to try to tempt a one at the church. And he does not bring things before him that will not tempt him. He rather corrupts him. Because the devil knows what will not tempt you. And he will not try you with what will not tempt you. Talk back to me if you can. But the devil knows how to corrupt you so that your witness will become ineffective. Holler all you want. You've been corrupted. Shout all you please. You've been corrupted. Praise all day long if you want. You have been corrupted. And then after he messes with the membership, after he corrupts the membership, he corrupts and confuses the leadership. Because if you can't get the members messed up, if you mess up the leadership, that will tear up the membership. Somebody ought to help me preach it. And they use the doctrine of the Nicolaitans to corrupt the leadership. The name Nicolaitan means to conquer the people. And I told you their plague was clericalism. They, they had a hierarchy of offices in the church, much like we have in church now. And we have it in the church now for a reason. But listen to me. The office of deacon is a biblical office. And the person who serves in that office ought to be respected because he holds a biblical office. But if he's not going to do the responsibilities of that office, he ought to resign or be asked to move. See how quiet you got right there? If you ain't going to pray, if you ain't going to show up on Tuesday night, see how quiet you got right there? If you're not going to tithe, if you're not going to lead in worship, don't have us to embarrass you. Just resign because you are not holding the office in the spirit of Christ. The same thing goes for the pastor and the preacher. The same thing goes for the Sunday school teacher and the president of the mission. The same thing goes for the ushers, the choir. If you're not going to hold these offices in the spirit of Christ, resign or we're going to ask you to move. Because a corrupted leadership ties up a membership. People know when you ain't doing nothing. They may not say anything, but they know you ain't doing nothing. And you know you ain't doing nothing. And we know you ain't doing nothing. But looking good on Sunday morning. And I don't care about you looking good on Sunday morning. I said, I said to, um, I said to someone in my circle, 
that um, my sister Gwen is in the hospital and she's having some, some memory problems. She's going to be a long time convalescing. She's going to come after she gets out of the hospital to live with me and I'm going to, I've, I've, I've committed myself uh, to taking care of her because she would do the same thing for me. And I said to someone in my circle and members of my family and, and, and people, uh, when, when the headlines was that she had a stroke and the Facebook was that she had 10 aneurysms, it was excitement and an opportunity to get sympathy. Not only for her, but for members of the family. Poor so-and-so. Oh, I feel so bad for you. You staying up at the hospital all night. And I wasn't excited at all because I knew when the dust settles, when the long process of taking care of Gwen would come into play, all the headline grabbers would go back to work and go back to their lives. Because when the hard work comes, you can't find them with a congressional search warrant. And that's the way it is at the church. Everybody looks good serving on Sunday, but where are you on Friday? Oh, I wish I had time to stay right there. I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. But when you corrupt the leadership, you can tear up the membership. And, and brothers and sisters, we got to correct folk. And that's not pleasant. That's not popular. That won't get you any admiration. People will not love you when you tell them the truth. But I got to answer to God. I've got to give an account of how I led this church as the pastor. And if I got to live by a certain standard, you got to live by a certain standard. And the standard is the same for everybody. Holiness. Uh, sadly, I fail at it sometimes. And I've got to get on my knees and ask God for forgiveness. Because it's right here in the text. He says, you better repent. Because if you don't repent, here's what he says, I will come and fight you with the sword of my mouth. And let me tell you what that means. The church is the bride of Christ. And any man who calls himself a man and won't fight for your woman is not worthy to be called a man. Somebody ought to help me preach it. No, 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 no. You can, you can say anything you want to say to me, just me and you. But now don't clown me in front of my woman. Don't front me in front of my wife because my manhood is on the line. And somebody's going to take me off of your black... Somebody ought to help me here. Jesus loves the church so much that he died for it. And if he died for it, he's sure enough going to fight for it. That's how a husband ought to love his wife. Like Christ loved the church. He loved the church so much that he gave his life for it. And anything you're willing to give your life for, you sure willing to fight for. Right, 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 right. This last word, and I'm gonna leave you alone. Cause y'all mad with me already. 
I'm going to get an email this week. Uh, like I got last week. I'm going to get a letter this week from somebody who won't sign their name. And I wish I knew who it was. So I could cuss them out right now. You are, you are, you are, you. Let me get back to the text. I, I, didn't, I didn't read it, so it, don't, it doesn't matter. I just know about it. Because, you know, if you throw a stone in a pack of dogs, the only one that hollers, yeah, is the one you hit. Dog. Yeah, that's what I called you. This last word, and, it, and it's right here in the text. And, and I was waiting. I've been waiting all the morning. I've been waiting all the week to get to verses 14 through 17. He gives them a word of consolation. After he gives them a word of commendation, after he gives them a word of confrontation, he gives them finally a word of consolation. And I've been waiting to get all the way down to verse number 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit saith unto the church. Here it is. To him that overcome will I give to eat of hidden manna. Hidden manna. Hidden manna. You remember in the Old Testament when they were in the wilderness and they got hungry. Bread was cooked in heaven. It was bread from heaven. It was food that angels dined on. That just fell on the earth. And it was called manna because manna means what is it? They did not know what it was because they had never seen anything like it nor tasted anything like it. And it just fell like morning dew. But here, here's the rub. They could not keep any overnight because if they tried to store it up it was spoiled I wish I had a Bible reading but to commemorate how God kept them Moses took a cup and put some manna in it and put it in the ark of the covenant that rested behind the holy of holies the separate was separated by the curtain of the most holy. And that cup of manna would not spoil. Somebody ought to help me close here. And so when he says, I will give you to eat of hidden manna, what he's saying is, don't sit at the table with the world and dine. I got some food that's better than that. You don't have to be like them. You don't have to talk like them. You don't have to live like them. I've got some resources that the world don't know anything about. Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. Feed me. Till I want no more. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled that's hidden man and then he says I will give him a white stone you're going to help me close this won't you that white stone was used in the court system in the first century that if you were brought up on charges and you were found guilty they put a black stone in your hand to signify your guilt. 
But if you had been acquitted, they would give you a white stone, which meant that everything was exonerated. One Friday, on the cross, Jesus died and took that black stone out of my hand, took that black heart out of my chest, and replaced that black stone, that black heart, with a white stone and a heart of purity. And then that white stone signified citizenship. And when I became a Christian, I became a citizen of another country. I live here in Houston, but my citizenship is in heaven. And then that white stone meant victory. After you completed, competed in the Olympic Games and in the Isthmian Games, they gave you a white stone that said you could go anywhere you want in the city. You were a celebrity. And then that white stone signified friendship. Friends would write their name on a white stone and break it in half. And they would be separated for years and years. And then they would come back together and put that stone together and rekindle their friendship. Jesus went away to prepare a place for me. And he and I took a white stone and broke it in half. And I got my half. And he got his half. And when he comes back again, we're going to put our two halves together. And we'll be friends all over again. And we'll go walking down the streets of heaven. And the angels won't be able to tell the difference between he or I. Because our white stone signifies our friendship is renewed. And then that white stone signified access. You could go in God's presence. And if he saw that white stone, anything you wanted... He would give it to you. And then finally, that stone has a new name written on it. You're going to help me close this, won't you? Back in those days, in the days when John wrote this letter dictated by Christ, when uh, a nobleman invited you to dinner, they would put a white stone on your seat. You're going to help me close this, won't you? And then the host would write, a special message underneath that stone that only the host and the guest knew what that message was. That's what the text is teaching us this morning. That when we get to heaven, there will be a white stone. And underneath that stone will be a new name written. Because I'm going to pull my chair back at the marriage feast of the Lamb. And when I pull my seat back, in my seat, there will be a stone. And underneath that stone, there will be a new name written. I don't know what that name is. I don't know what that name means. I just want to pull my chair back, raise up my stone, and see my new name. I don't want to know what it is. That doesn't excite me to know what my name is. I'm just glad my name will be written on that stone. When the roll is called up yonder, I will be there because my name is already written in the Lamb's book of life. Is there anybody here who know your name is already written on your stone? You're not trying to be better than anybody else. You're not here this morning to impress anybody. You just came to thank God for your new name. Your name might signify what kind of Christian you were here on earth. And whatever kind of work you did in the church, that might be what your name is. Your name might be encourager. Your name might be joyful person. But whatever your name is, just be happy that your name 
is written on your stone. I wish I had a believer here who know you've been born again. You know your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You know you've been redeemed. You don't always get it right. You sin and mess up sometimes. But God loves you. He loves you so much that he died for you. And so you came here this morning and you don't care who's looking at you. You don't care what nobody says about you. Your name is written on your stone. And you came to shout about that. If the Lord opened doors for you, praise his name. If the Lord been good to you, magnify his name. If the Lord save your soul, thank him for his grace. Why don't you grab somebody? Why don't you hug somebody? Tell them I'm glad I know my name. I'm glad he knows my name. I'm glad, 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 glad. glad. I know he's all right. He has a stone with his name on it. And I got a stone with my name on it. And one of these days, we're going to put our stones together. And I'm going to sing. I'm going to shout. I'm going to cry aloud of the mercy of God, of the grace of God and the goodness of God because he let me enter into his presence.